Welcome, rock and rollers, to another episode of the Ugly American Werewolf in London Rock Podcast, recorded just off Abbey Road here in London. And we want to make a salute this week to very special members of rock and rolldom, and that's the Kiss Army, because today we're going to talk about Kiss, and specifically the Kiss Alive 2 album. Now, if you grew up in the 70s and the 80s, like Jackson and I did, Kiss were not only a big part of pop culture, they at times could have seemed ubiquitous. They were everywhere, and thanks to the brilliant Mark marketing of Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley, they got their faces on all sorts of products in front of people young and old. But before they completely sold out, before they got to the 80s and had to change their act and take the makeup off and kind of reinvent themselves, and after they'd already broke big with Alive in 1976, Kiss were under the gun, under the love gun, if you will. After having their first real big selling album and a big hit with the Alive record, they had to come up with the goods on the studio side. And they were up to the task as they were then able able to produce three classic records that propelled them into even greater stardom and allowed them to continue to gain new fans over the decades and still tour to this day. Those three albums, Destroyer, Rock and Roll Over, and Love Gun, were captured live on Kiss Alive 2, put out in 1978, just two years after Live. But for us, it really captured the band at their best. Their best material with the biggest stage show. And they were on top of the world. And even though we went to college in the 90s, when we found the discs in the used bin at the CD store across the street from college, we had to pick it up. And we have very fond memories of getting back into KISS and remembering their heyday from 1978 with Alive 2. Before we get into the show, I want to remind you to follow us on Twitter at Ugly underscore werewolf, and check out all our past episodes. We're at www.uglyamericanwerewolf.libsyn, L I B S Y N dot com. Of course, you can download and subscribe most anywhere you get your podcast. So, for children of the 70s and 80s, members of the Kiss Army, get your boots on. We're marching back to 1978 to review Kiss Alive 2 here on The Wolf. <laughs> So say what you want about KISS, but a KISS live show is something very special. It's it's almost like a religious experience. I've been to a couple of hundred rock shows in my life, including somewhere between eight and twelve KISS shows. And nobody else can really come close to capturing the energy and the pyro and the fun. You can say what you want about them as artists or as, say, their lyrics are sophomoric and childish. But the experience of a KISS show is like nothing else. And I think the everybody else on the face of the earth who enjoys giant rock shows today are, they have KISS to thank for that. I mean, they were the ones that ushered that in. The I paid money for this ticket. I don't want to see just four guys on a stage. I want to see, yes, thousand-foot pyro blow-ups and yeah the things coming out on stage and the drum rise were coming up i mean everybody ripped that off of kiss that's just how it works that's they, how it they works. ushered in they ushered in the mind even, even we were talking about last week we were talking about the rolling stones and the giant steel wheels show mm-hmm. that would probably not have been possible without somebody seeing kiss saying okay this is what you do yes people want to see fire and giant shows well and the thing is too at this point in time they were playing big arenas and you know, I mean, if you're in row triple C mm-hmm. with the rest of the I can't see the band, but I can see the show. That's right, man. And, you know, coming out of the glam rock of the early 70s, they put a different take on it. No, their music isn't for everybody. And they obviously didn't sell albums. Talking about Alive 2 here, Alive 1 is what really broke Kiss as a huge band in America. What happened was they made three records, Kiss, Hotter Than Hell, and Dressed to Kill. They had some Kiss classic songs on there, but they weren't selling. But they were doing great live. They were touring act. They worked their tails off. They, they played hundreds of shows a year and would open for anybody, went all over the place. But it wasn't translating on the radio. And part of it was they could not capture what was happening live on the record. It just wasn't translating onto vinyl. And the first record, I think, was good. Has some Kiss classics on there. Uh, They play a lot of that stuff to this day. Hotter Than Hell, I didn't think was great. And Dress to Kill, Take Away Rock and Roll All Night, wasn't their greatest effort either. You can see some some growth, I guess you could call it. But it just just wasn't translating into into great radio rock and roll. Yeah, I think that was their problem at that time, is they were kind of stalled after that third record. Like, what do we do? I don't know. I mean, again, like you said, we're not really selling these albums, but we can't 
you know, we sell out every night in the live show. So yes, a live one comes out and that changes the fortune of everything that, that puts them on the, the superstar path. There's a, there was a great quote I heard the other day from Gene Simmons saying, anybody who gets into rock and roll to, uh, says they don't want to be famous is lying. <laughs> so, and then I think that was, that was always his thing is he wanted to be the greatest rock and roll, you know, icon on the face of the earth. That was his passion in life. And with Alive, he was definitely, I wouldn't say he was there yet, but he was definitely on his way. And so was the rest of the band. That's right. That's right. And you got to believe it was a huge risk. I mean, now live albums sell big. And thanks to like Frampton comes alive selling, I don't know, a hundred bajillion copies in the 70s. It kind of legitimized it. But in the early 70s and 60s, live albums didn't always do that well because the technology wasn't there yet necessarily to create a quality live album. And my dad used to tell me, because like I'd be buying something cool, like a, a, a good uh, Stones live album or something we would listen to, and be like, ah, don't buy live albums. They, they sound horrible. They, you know, they don't know how to record. I'm like, well, Dad, your, your experience is from buying records in the 60s. And from your experience, you're right. You know, they didn't make them well back then. So putting out a live album to save them probably wasn't a fantastic idea. And then it was a double album, right? So it's like, okay, you haven't sold any of the single studio albums you don't have any hits off of them and you're gonna put out a double live album and if it had failed the band probably would have gone under in fact i think the whole casablanca records would have totally gone on right because they didn't have many other acts kiss wasn't selling they were kind of became famous for disco and donna summer but that hadn't taken off yet this is 1976 and disco hadn't really come along yet so they were in a lot of trouble but they put out the live record it goes through the roof and it changes their fortunes completely. And it's interesting because Frampton Comes Alive didn't come out till 76. So I think this did kind of pave the way of you can you can make a live record and sell a ton of these things. Mm -hmm. But you're right. It, I, I think, yes, this everything for Casablanca Records, as I understand it, was hanging on the release of Alive. Like they were either going to make it or they were going to go down the toilet in flames. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was huge. Everybody kind of, I think that started the, the Kiss revolution and turned a lot of people on who maybe had heard... Like, like, yeah, I've heard of them somewhere, a guy. Mm -hmm. And then you got this and said, wait a minute, I'm missing the boat here. Now, of course, Kiss Alive is famously not all that alive, right? It, it was recorded over four or five nights in four or five different cities or something like that. But, but then they had to it, punch it up, right? <laughs> yeah, I think that's, that's what, and then that could have been, I don't know. I, I, I wasn't there. Nobody asked me about this. But it could have been either, you know, it, like we were talking about before, the recording wasn't what they were looking for, or maybe the something wasn't up to par vocals, or, mm -hmm. you know, that the levels could have been off. I don't know. But yeah, it, it did get punched up. And that's always the, the what people complain about about live records. Yes, it's recorded live, but is what you're hearing what you heard that night? Probably not on everything. You got to clean some stuff up. Right. And so they say maybe like everything except for Peter's drums. <laughs> were re-recorded uh, and the, the, the sound of the crowd even was piped in louder like they took the best bits of all the crowds and, and piped it in there just to make it feel like the crowd was going nuts the whole time and give it that live feel but I gotta tell you it worked it, it certainly paid off and then there's kind of the double-edged sword okay now you got what you wanted right you have this huge hit and you're allowed to go out and tour and make a lot of money and be the, the headliner and all that but now you gotta follow up alive with some quality quality studio stuff, right? It's time to now release studio records, get some hits that justify your status as this huge band. So, of course, they go in to create Destroyer, which I got to believe most people consider the best Kiss studio album ever. I would imagine so. I mean, I was kind of, I was thinking about that as I, as I was doing a little research for this deal, and I've, I've got to say that that is, that is the quintessential Kiss record. You know, if you're a Kiss purist, you can probably sit there and argue with me. Well, you know, so love going and rock and roll. Okay, but no, they had, I mean, Shout It Out Loud, God of Thunder, Flaming Youth, Detroit Rock City, and Beth were all singles from the record. Mm -hmm. It's got the iconic cover on it. Um, everybody's looking, you know, super rock star-y. It's not a picture, it's a painting. This is it, and you're right. To come off of that huge live record with this studio record, mm -hmm. you could not have asked for anything more than this. And they're working with Bob Ezrin, legendary <laughs> producer who helped them create some of their greatest albums. They also worked a lot with Deep Purple, worked with Pink Floyd on the wall. And, and in fact, Ezrin is working with 
Deep Purple again. He's worked with him over the last four or five studio albums over the last couple of decades. And he helped write a lot of the songs too. Like he's a co-writer on Detroit Rock City. You know, he, he's a co-writer on Flaming Root Youth and Shout It Out Loud and Do You Love Me and Beth. I mean, these are classic Kiss songs that they still play today. Shout It Out Loud is a fantastic anthem and they, they'll they never not play Shout It Out Loud again. And that's an interesting deal too because I think that kind of shows you what, what the head spits was for Gene and Paul and everybody else there to, to accept that hell in quotes. They knew Bob knew what he was doing. Okay, you know, I I, I don't know whether he was in on the original writing or he was there to, there to punch up what they had, but they took his advice and they put out an album that is I, I, there aren't too many blow spots on it and it's it's to, to this day like we were talking about before it's probably the most iconic Kiss record no doubt about it and you're right the cover uh, is fantastic those guys are breaking out you know off of a I don't know is it off a mountain or something I don't know but it looks like they're about to take over the world uh, in their killer 1976 outfit and you mentioned there were five singles off what is basically a nine song record there's a one and a half minute instrumental at the end of the side too. It's kind of filler. So more than half became singles. And interestingly enough, Beth was the last of those five released, right? It went Shout It Out Loud, God of Thunder, Flaming Youth, Detroit Rock City. Beth was the last one, which they kind of thought was a throwaway. But I, it was the B-side of Detroit Rock City, right? We'll, we'll release Detroit Rock City. That's the big one. And the DJs flipped it over because it had this nice song, Beth, on it. And it was easily their biggest hit of the original lineup era. It's the only top 10 hit they ever had. Which is weird when you think about uh, rock and roll all night. Do you think that that's the big one? But no, that you're right. It is Beth, which you know then will just one day morph into the, your whole hair metal deal. You know, kind of the formula for how to be a hit. Well, that's, that's that was right. probably the original. I mean, again, I can only imagine like the the people listening to it on the radio, like not Kiss fans, like oh, you know, well, this is a nice song. Oh, it's okay. Mm-hmm. And then you find out it's Kiss, and then I'm sure the Kiss fans in, in 1976 went, "What? Mm-hmm. No, I don't want." What is this? No. I mean, I guess, you know, it's one of the things you listen to the old lady that she'd make that she'd be happy about that, not the rest of the stuff. But yeah, just a definite departure. But it's weird that that was their biggest hit. That was their biggest hit kind of by far. And you're right about Rock and Roll All Night. It is their big anthem. But when it was released off Dress to Kill, it didn't do very well. Now, when Alive came out and it did well, they released the live version of it. And that's why if you listen to classic rock radio, a lot of times you'll hear the live right. version. That's what they play because they've been playing it for 45 years now. So then, okay, so that's that comes out in March of 76. Then later in 1976, in November, after a huge tour for Destroyer, they put out rock and roll over which again is strong it's it's great it's again got a killer cover on it but then you know you've got i want you something they continue to do to this day big calling dr love that's big for gene of course um (laughs) you know making love is a big one for for paul He, he still likes to do that one and you know because peter had the big hit with beth he not only got one he got two songs on the record. He got Baby Driver, which is not not his best, but uh, but he also sang Hard Lock Woman, which was a Paul Stanley song. He wrote Baby Driver with the same guy, Stan Pendridge, with whom he wrote Beth. But, you know, Hard Lock Woman was a single uh, and a minor hit. It was the first single they released off the record because they figured, well, if Peter hit gold with the last time, why don't we do it again, right? Yeah, I, I, I would be interested to know. I, I think that's probably the reason they were looking for another big radio hit to have him sing that. I like that song a lot. I, I was not, I didn't know. I knew he wrote the other one, Baby Driver. I didn't know that he didn't write Hard Luck Woman. That was that was a Paul Stanley song mm-hmm. that, that he gave to him to do that. It, it's a nice change of pace, too. I mean, like, I think Paul's got a great rock and roll voice, but it's cool to hear uh, other people get a chance to shine well yeah as we talked about on episode 15 on the eagles having three four different singers it gives you a lot of different directions you can change your sound and do a lot of different things gene and paul do most of the singing obviously but then be able to throw peter in there adds just another dimension Uh, and, and paul's you know singing his hot love songs i want you take me making love that kind of stuff Whereas Simmons is love them, leave them, ladies room, <laughs> calling Dr. Love. You know, he he is not unimpressed with himself, is he? He's pretty sure everybody wants him. But, you know, 
you make your best album ever, you follow up with this, that's solid. And you, yeah, you make it eight months later, which is again what they did in the 70s. And then June next year, seven months later, they create Love Gun, another killer album, another killer cover with some great Kiss classics on there. And of course, we see the first time ever uh, lead vocals of Mr. Ace Fraley, Shock Me. Yeah, which is, mm, I was always kind of, when you, when you go back and really start to think about that, I was always kind of sad because I thought he should, and I know he was, he didn't think he could do it at the time, but I really wanted him to sing Cold Gin. Right. Uh, back from the first record. I think that would have been great. He's done it on his uh, Origins mm-hmm. record. A couple of, it sounds fantastic, but uh, like I said, I think he just was not confident enough in his vocals at that point in time. But yeah, it is cool to hear Ace get out in front and do uh, uh, and do Shock Me. And the story on that one is fantastic about how playing in Florida somewhere, and he was coming down the stairs and literally got electrocuted. Mm-hmm. That he touched the handrail and was like, and, you know, like passed out, and they woke him up, and they're like, "Okay, you need to play the show." Not like, "Let's go to the hospital." It's like, "Okay, yeah, let's go. Just put me back on stage." And, yeah, it was yeah. not that far from where we went to school, man. It was in Lakeland, in Central okay. Florida. And yeah, he shocked himself. And he's like, oh my God, I don't know if I can do this. And the kids are going, ace, ace. And he's like, all right, I'll come out and do the show. He had written songs on previous albums, but this was his first chance to really sing one. And listen, Ace is not a great vocalist, but he has a certain style that kind of also fits his playing and also fits the lyrics that he's singing. Just like a A Keith Richards song is not a Mick Jagger song. An Ace Frehley song is not a Paul Stanley song. They're not going to sing the same way or sing the same kind of songs. But I'm with you. I like Ace's voice, and I'm glad that he stepped out in front and started singing a little. Yeah, yeah, and and it's again, it's a nice change of pace. It's it's cool when they hand the microphone over to him and everybody else can kind of just groove. Paul Stanley does not get enough credit as a guitar player. Uh, So, you know, he gets a chance to kind of step back and do a little more playing. Yeah, I I, I love that. And, And to hear... Ace just, you know, kind of nonchalantly saying that he was electrocuted and then got back on stage like it was no big deal. Like, I think he often gets overlooked as a rock star, but Mm. that's somebody you could just sit to and listen to story after story after story. I think there's the story about how he used to like to have Alex Lyson sit on his lap (laughs) and do the, uh, you know, the the, the ventriloquist. He was a ventriloquist. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Just stuff like that. It's just outstanding. A true gem in rock and roll. Now, there's one, before we get to Alive 2, again, Stanley's doing fun stuff tomorrow and tonight. He does love gun. Can't imagine what that's about. Um, right? But um, got love for sale there, Simmons. And, and he's got Plaster Caster. Of course, Plaster Caster, the Plaster Casters were a group of groupies who followed rock stars around and would make molds of their, let's say, members, uh, the the other members of the band. Uh, and Gene, of course, heard about this. He's like, oh, well, of course they're going to want to hook up with me. So he wrote the song Plaster Caster, not based on experience, but figuring I'll write this song for them. And then, of course, they'll, they'll want to get with me. And they still didn't because... Gene's still not their cup of tea. They like cool guys like Jimi <laughs> Hendrix and The Who. And Gene's just, yeah, he's too straight. He doesn't drink. He doesn't smoke. He's too type A business. He's like, you're not a rock star. You're a guy in kabuki makeup who's just hitting on me all the time. You're supposed to like have a smoke a joint, drink a beer, hit on my girlfriends, then nonchalantly tell me I'm cute. Not like, hey, you want to hook up? I'm rich. Want to hook up yeah. with me? No? Okay. How about you? You up? Yeah. No? Oh, no. How about you? Fine. Yes, you good. Come on. Because that's Gene, you know, it's it's Shixes and money. That's that's all it is for. Him. But the one that would get him in the most trouble today was the single Christine Sixteen. In this that's era a... of the Me Too movement, and, and and having a talking part. When I saw you coming out of that school that day, I knew I got to have you. He would be canceled. Kiss would yeah. have been canceled if they put this yeah. song out. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of stuff when, when you look at it. You know, you want to talk about uh, double entendre. It's single on time like, right. there's no they're coming right right down the middle there yeah I, yeah when you listen to that i heard that not too long ago and yeah he gets into the talking part you're like wow you would seriously be in prison right now for yeah this, this is not, not right this is not cool <laughs> no it's really not it's not cool <laughs> But so those three albums were very strong. 
fantastic. Made all of them in about, was it 15 months? Something like that. 16 months. Something crazy like that. And then, of course, it was time to put out the second live album. Who doesn't put out a second live album two years after the last one, right? <laughs> um, but, you know, things were, were getting a little sideways at this point. You know, Peter and Ace were starting to party way too much. Peter was kind of feeling his oats because Beth had been such a big hit. So he's like, well, I, I'm a pretty darn good songwriter. I, I can be a, maybe do a solo album or I don't need Kiss. You know, I don't need all the, the fanfare and the, the pressure and all that kind of stuff. And Ace is out there partying the same way. He's like, yeah, you know, you guys are too cooperative. Uh, you know, that's that's kind of my bad ace impression. But, you know, they they, they didn't want to be there in suits and go to business meetings. They just wanted to party and play rock and roll. So they well, needed... Well, interesting. I, I was going to say it was interesting because I always thought this... I, I never liked the cover of this record. I just thought it was kind of thrown together. But it's interesting how Alive 1 has a cool picture of everybody on stage together. Mm-hmm. And Alive 2 has four individual photos. Maybe it was done on purpose, maybe it wasn't, but yeah, you to your point, this was the fracturing, like things were starting to go, starting to get away from them, out from under them. I mean, they'd sold a million records, they, they've toured nonstop since mm-hmm. they started, pressure of everything is starting to get to them. Right, right, and you know, Gene and Paul are basically straight, you know, no drugs, no alcohol, uh, and Peter and Ace really, really weren't. So that divides a pretty big fracture between the two and it, because Paul and Gene think Ace and Peter aren't pulling their weight uh, and they're not coming in in the best condition that they can. And then Ace and Peter are like, we're just as good as you. Plus, isn't this what we got into a rock and roll band for in the first place is to go out and party and, and have fun. So they made Alive 2 and they didn't want to overlap with Alive 1, right? They didn't want anything from the first three records on there. So they come out and again, it's a double album and they pull stuff off those three albums. Open in with Detroit Rock City, which they still love to open with today. Fantastic way to open a show. And yeah, they, that's, a, that's a strong opener. It's pretty strong, right? I mean, they could close with that if they wanted to, but yeah. they open with it. It's fantastic. Um, and then King of the Nighttime World. I always loved this. Uh, I, I thought it was an underrated Kiss song. It's not real long. It's only about three minutes, but I'm the King of the Nighttime World. You're my headline queen and it's got a little bit of good A stuff in the middle there i think it's good and i didn't realize that one of the co-writers was kim fowley who's kind of a music impresario weirdo from la he he managed the runaways back in the late 70s kind of an odd character but probably fit pretty well in with kiss world somehow right (laughs) and he he seemed to like young girls managing the runaways wasn't just because he thought they were good musicians and that probably fit in well with gene group of young ladies come back and (laughs) yeah yeah, i I like that i like king of the nighttime world i think it's really cool that you could do a whole nother record with completely new tracks, like a completely new track listing. And I think, because I was listening to this whole deal start to finish, and all of these, I mean, all the songs, I mean, they're not all gems, but I don't think Kiss gets enough credit for writing songs. Like when you listen to this, like they're like I said, they're not all great, but they're pretty good. And they didn't go back; they, they didn't pull any from the original. Like, oh, we got to put you know rock and roll all night on this, or no one's going to mm-hmm. buy it. No, they they went straight ahead and did all new stuff, which I think is cool. And to your point, like Ladies Room, I don't think that's I don't think the lyrics are great. The riff is great, though. Mm-hmm. It's a good rock and roll song. And if you change the lyrics to something else, maybe something that's a little more subtle or something like that, versus meet you in the ladies' room. Um, <laughs> Just like a hammer to the head. You know, yeah. It's being pretty obvious there, Gene. Yeah. But it's great. It's a great riff, you know. Making Love, again, not my favorite, but it's got some killer riff in it. And then you finish side one of the first record with Love Gun, all-time Kiss classic. And Ace, you know, doing the solo where Bill's the doodle 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 it's It's killer. And to kind of come out with a machine gun beginning. Yeah. Fantastic. And, and on that one, Paul, I, I think Paul was underrated. I said he was an underrated guitar player. I think he's he's also one of the most underrated just singers, vocal talent. I mean, he can sing his face off. He's an amazing and, singer. Yeah. And, and especially, I mean, Love Gun, he's got the big, big vocal performance here. And I think that that is, that's a strong way to, to end the first side there. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. And I think he played the main role in Phantom of the Opera like in Toronto for like over a hundred shows or something like that yeah. in the 90s. Mm-hmm. I mean, he is a real talent. He's easily the best singer in the band. Gene's not really much of a singer, but he has a distinct voice and obviously he has something to say. Yeah. <laughs> 
Right. And then again, back to your point about Ace, he Gene sings Gene songs. Right. That's that's the deal. Probably the most famous is uh, God of Thunder, which we'll get to in a minute. It's a Paul Stanley song, but he wrote for Gene Simmons. Mm-hmm. Like I'm just gonna go. I know exactly what your deal is, you know. And it's a really cool song. And and his nobody else could sing that. That's right. That's that's definitely him. And and they break this up, right? I mean, Paul sings the first couple songs. Gene gets one. Paul's gets a couple. Flip to the second side. Calling Doctor Love, obviously a Gene song. <laughs> But I love it. I mean, it's mm, yeah. it, it's it's kind of nasty. It's a perfect kiss song. It's funny, but it's it, it's a good song. Then it follows up with Christine sixteen, of course, like yeah. giving Gene his little time there. But then, yeah, Shock Me by Ace comes over, and on the record, Paul says, "We got a little surprise for you tonight. We're gonna turn the microphone over to Ace Frehley. Shock me." <laughs> And because Ace didn't sing before that. But this was also Ace's time to shine. Everybody kind of gets their own solo time in Kiss. The other guys go off stage, get a drink of water or, you know, a snort or whatever they need. Or maybe Gene's saying, okay, the girl in the third row, get her. The girl in the sixth row, get her. Get the mom and daughter in the tenth row, you know. But it gives him a chance to play. But he also gets to do his solo uh, in the middle of it where he would often, he had that killer Les Paul that had some of the pickups taken out where he could put a light in smoke bombs in there and it looks like his guitar was on fire and smoking he would play that part during there and that's cool and, and he's, he continued to do that even on the reunion tours in the late 90s and the early 2000s he, he still has that guitar he even does it in his solo act to this day and if you have never seen that before it is really cool to see I mean I, I know you and I saw them different different times on the reunion tour mm-hmm. and I saw them at Madison Square Garden and to watch him do that you know you know what's coming you know what's going to happen right. it's still awesome and then he lets go and the thing it goes it gets drawn up to the ceiling and it's you know you think it's on fire it's not fire but still it looks yeah, cool it's, it's really cool showmanship. It's amazing. Yeah, it's fun. That's the thing. People yeah. who say Kiss is no good or, you know, you're just listening to the songs. You're right. It's not deep like Bob Dylan or the Beatles or something like that. It's about entertainment. It's it's not about getting you to think your deepest, most inner thoughts and, and review. Well, how do I really feel about my relationship with my parents? You know, it's about going out and partying and having fun. And, and that's, that's what the show is all about. But moving on, moving on. They go to Hard Luck Woman after that so Peter gets a chance to sing and you know they maybe pull out some 12 string guitars for that and then they finish up side two of the first record or or disc number one with Tomorrow and Tonight. Again you know, tomorrow and tonight, we can rock all day, we can roll all night. You know, I can smoke four joints and write a better lyric than that. Um, but it's fun. And again, the riff, the melody, it's all good. It fits in perfectly. Another just not even three and a half minute songs. Most of Kiss's songs are three, three and a half minutes. And this is another one. And again, it's 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 fun. Yeah, and it, that's it's not one of my favorites, but it's got a great little ace solo in there and he gets to kind of shine a little bit mm-hmm. um, it, yeah you could have come up with better lyrics that's fine but yeah fun song fun song all right so then you go to side three or disc two if you had the cd like we do it starts with i stole your love again killer riffs again it's it's not an amazing song but it's got some cool vocal effects in it for paul again ace does a little bit of good ace work in it and again it, it's if it wasn't a kiss song it probably wouldn't be that good but with Kiss, it fits in with everything else, and it, I like it. Then Peter gets another chance to shine with Beth, mm-hmm. uh, and I think they're piping in the piano at this point. Nobody's actually playing it live, to the best of my knowledge. Um, but Peter gets out on a stool and sits there and sings his little ballad, and all the girls scream. They think it's fantastic, and then he gets right back behind the, the drums for God of Thunder, which is kind of his time to shine also, because although now God of Thunder is where Gene like spits his blood and spits fire at the end of it and maybe even flies up in the air. Mm -hmm. I think back in the day, God of Thunder was Peter Chris on the drums. He would do his drum solo. Now, did the drum riser come up during that part? Maybe so. I'm not sure. That had the big cats on the front of it. Yeah, probably. But yeah, that's that is really cool when he goes into his... His solo, I, I, again, I think that these guys start to finish don't get enough credit for being musicians. I think he was a big, what they say, he was like a swing band kind of drummer before he got in there. And you can tell he's he's got skills playing the drums. No doubt. And he's different from Eric Carr. Eric Carr was a great drummer, kind of pure, straight ahead rock and roll drummer. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like Peter Chris is to Bill Ward as Eric Carr is to Vinnie Apice. You know, Bill and Peter had more of a jazz swing thing, although hard and heavy. 
mm -hmm. had more of that, whereas the guys who replaced them at about the exact same time, by the way, had more of a straight hard rock thing and maybe could do more, but it lost a certain something when it wasn't them anymore. Correct, yeah, because because the thing is you're playing you're playing the part of Peter Chris, but you're not you don't have the soul. And the same thing with, with Vinny, you know, when you get into the it, it's just that you're just doing a, a reenactment of it. And that's gonna come that's gonna come into play a little later with later on here when we get into somebody perhaps impersonating somebody else. But that's it's okay. That's we'll worry about that little, later, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Little right. little sneak peek there. Yeah. So then um I want you is the second to last song on the live bit by Stanley. This is one they still do to this day and it's it's kind of cool because it's soft you know it starts off kind of slow and in latter days they really use it as a way to get the audience to interact like he would sing the the first part in the morning i raise my head and sing that and they go is and he get the crowd all jammed up yeah. it's like come on gotta be better than that let's try to get yeah. doo -doo -doo. And then, i can't hear you and then -na 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 -na, you know it gets heavy and then he does that again towards the end so a classic kiss song is always fit in with their set and then you it, it, it sounded it, well it's I was going to say, it sounded to me like there was a little like back and forth between him and Ace. Like the solo kind of gets thrown back and forth a little bit, which is always cool to hear. Yeah, I sincerely wish there was some full-on Alive 2 video. And maybe in one of the Kissologies, Kiss put out three different DVD sets. Kissology Volume 1, which was, I think, all the original band. Volume 2, which was into the 80s. And then Volume 3, which was kind of latter days. And it was their music videos, interviews, some TV specials and some live concert stuff that they had in the vaults. I don't have them with me, of course, now in London. They're in a box in a storage facility, but I do have all three of them. And I, I don't think there was a full Alive 2 video, which is kind of horrible, and it's bad news, because so much of KISS is the visual component, and seeing them live, and to see this live, whether it was the recording they did on the Love Gun tour, or they actually did a 56-day Alive 2 tour, uh, from 78 to 79, late 78 into 79, to promote the Alive record and sell more tickets. You would have thought that they would have made a movie or something about that. Yeah, and it's too bad, too, because we were talking about uh, at the beginning the gatefold that you got with this and the, the picture of everybody on the risers with the pyro. This was the kind of the apex of the classic Kiss, they, the biggest show they were going to do in the classic Kiss lineup. I mean, they got together. They did the reunion tour, and this that was kind of a, I want to say a retread, but I mean, as far as like first run, mm -hmm. this was the biggest tour they'd ever done. Yeah, and what Jackson's talking about, folks, is when Alive 2 originally came out, it came with like a 35-page booklet on the evolution of KISS with all sorts of pictures from the shows. Um, it had the lyrics of the five studio songs that we're going to get into here later, kind of telling the story of them. Um, it also came with some temporary tattoos. and just They were all about giving the fans as much product and, and, and quality as they could. Uh, and the original, if, if you got it in mint condition, is worth, especially if you still have the tattoos, is worth a you know a little small chunk of change. And it's too bad because more bands did get into this because you're right. You wanted to buy more than just the record. You wanted to see everything else that was going to come with it. And I probably at that point in time you didn't know what was going to be there. They, I mean the internet wasn't around. They right. had. I mean you knew the record was coming out, so you bought this thing and said, "Oh my goodness, look at all this other stuff in there." And you're right. If you still had it with temporary tattoos, that would be fantastic. That would be awesome. You know. And you mentioned the cover isn't as cool. Well, the Kiss Alive 1, that was a stage cover. That wasn't shot from a concert that's like, okay, boys, go out there and strike a pose and we'll get something for the cover. Whereas the gatefold in the middle of Alive 2, it was also staged, but it was the whole stage with all the pyro going off at once, with the drum riser up, with the boys going up in the air on their own risers. Killer shot. And just the epitome of the excess of Kiss in the 70s. And, and the reason why they could come back and do it again in the 90s and to this day is because they pulled it off back then. <laughs> All right, wrap it up. Wrap it up with Shout It Out Loud. Again, I love this song. It's so much fun. My daughter started singing this song when she was three years old. And it's hilarious to hear a three-year-old little girl going, you got to have a party. <laughs> uh, that's the old guys indoctrinating the next generation into the stuff that they love. Yeah, I think this one is overlooked in the in the the history of kiss you know rock and roll all night is kind of their the anthem but mm -hmm. i think this is up there with it I, I like it better to be honest with you i mean as far as what i would maybe it's because i've heard rock and roll all night too much maybe it's because too many non-kiss fans know it and it's almost mm -hmm. like a cliche or it's too much a big part of pop culture 
but shout it out loud is it's fun and it's loud and it's you know it's about rebellion don't let them tell you that there's too much noise they're too old to really you've, understand you've got to have a party you've got like, to there's have no a party. yeah not like we probably should it's a good idea no you have to call all your friends in the neighborhood hello get the party started and even ace gets a little vocal on here towards the end um, uh, yeah. you know he goes because everybody's shouting now awesome so give aces due but yeah great and so and we we listen to this back to back again we bought this used at the used record store across the street from campus because it was a double CD and going out and spending 30 bucks was on, on two discs was almost impossible back then. I remember when the Guns N' Roses Use Your Illusions 1 and 2 albums went out and I went to Peaches at midnight to buy them. I was only going to buy one. I was going to buy number two because yeah, 30 bucks is a lot to shell out for, for two records. And we did listen to those a lot, but then I, you know, I didn't eat for a few days after that. But you had to make choices. You got to make choices when you young but yeah buying this and you know it, it was used for a reason there was some scratches on it on you know something you could hear you know for the first couple minutes of the album i feel like or one of the discs but eventually that went away <laughs> I wondered who, I was kind of wondered who gave that up. Like who, it, I can only imagine it was somebody, it, maybe they, they moved and their, you know, whoever, mom, dad said, ah, we're never going to listen to this. Let's just go ahead and sell this. I can't imagine anybody saying, I'll never listen to this again. I'm going to sell. Now here's the interesting part of Kiss Alive too. Because they couldn't use, or they weren't going to use songs from the first album, or for the first Alive one, or the first three studio albums, they now have a whole fourth side that they need to fill. So they go in and make five new studio songs. So the first 15 songs, first three sides on the LPs are alive, and then side four is five new songs. Now, these are fairly weak songs, I gotta say. And, and reading up on this, it's like, it's kind of becoming obvious that they're getting a little low on material. And if you make three good solid albums in 15 16 months and you're touring constantly in between it's not a shock to me that they may not have the best of the best ready to go right i can't i can't even imagine that i can't imagine putting out three albums in 15 months yeah we have, what else do you have uh mary had a little lamb like right. what, do you want, what do you want me to say a tank is empty yeah so so we got all american man by stanley paul sings it not a great song <laughs> not 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 real good but it might be better than the next song rocking in the usa by gene simmons just talk about trying to pander to the audience and just make something that will grab a hold of it. Some, some of the music's not bad, but the lyrics are just so cheesy. It's like it got them off the back of a Velveeta box, man. And I wonder too, you know, with, with the time frame, like I was listening to All American Man mm -hmm. and it's not, no, it, it, the, the lyrics are terrible, but it's not a bad riff. So not I bad riff. wonder if maybe some of these things, like they were, they weren't even really finished and mm -hmm. they said you had to have new songs and they were like oh okay let's just let's just you know polish up a couple of these and just put them out on the on the fourth side because uh yeah the, it, the, the lyrics are just like you know gonna have a uh, i don't know rock in the usa cool go put right. it out and they and just then, come off tour right i mean yeah. in, in late august of of 70 in late august of 77 they were on tour they had just gotten back from japan i think they did a few nights at the budokan or whatever they recorded it in august and then in September 13th through the 16th they recorded these songs so obviously they had ideas and maybe some demos of them before that but they'd just been touring hard and I was like okay now we gotta come up with these songs so they do All American Man they went back to Electric Lady Studios in New York to do these Rock in the USA not good Larger Than Life gee Gene when you say my love is larger than life what, yeah. what could it be that you're talking about? <laughs> maybe his maybe his heart. He's got a lot of love to give. That, I don't that know. could be it. I'm, I'm not sure, but I know the song sucks, Gene. <laughs> <laughs> not good. But the standout, of course, for us and for everyone is Ace Frehley's Rocket Ride. Again, not that subtle. When uh, you know she wants a rocket ride, you know, grab a hold of my rocket. I got the rocket. She wants oh, the ride. Oh yeah. Starting to come together. Gotcha. But again, it gave Ace another chance to sing, and it's a pretty darn good Ace 
song. It's it's really the only redeeming quality of the studio songs, I would say. And and I believe, if I'm not wrong, this uh, remembering this correctly, I think Rocket Ride was. I think just he and Peter did this one, and I think this was supposed to be a single uh, solo track for him. This was kind of the starting point of yeah, I think I'm going to go do my own thing, and mm-hmm. it got put on this thing. And yeah, this was the standout on this on this one. No doubt, yeah, and and that's what was going on. Peter and Ace wanted to to kind of do solo records. So in early '78, to buy some time, they put out Double Platinum, which was a greatest hits album, uh, and they reworked Strutter on there, um, gave it kind of a different mm-hmm. beat. But otherwise, it was basically their 20 greatest hits. And then later in the year, they put out this Alive Two. While they could each one of them could put out a solo record, and then they wrap it up with "Any Way You Want It" by the Dave Clark Five. Now, as a Kiss song goes, if I was a teenager and I heard this song, I'd be like, "What in the world are they doing?" But to be honest with you, I I find myself kind of bobbing my head or, or going back and forth. It's it's catchy. I mean, it was a hit back in the '60s, right? Yeah, I think Dave Clark, they kind of, the Dave Clark Five kind of got eclipsed pretty hard by the Beatles and the Stones, but mm-hmm. they did have some good hits coming out of the British Invasion. I always think it's interesting when, when bands like this cover songs, because mm-hmm. obviously, you know, you had to start somewhere. Little Paul Stanley, or Stanley Eisen, right. as it were, or Stuart sitting in his bedroom listening to records, and that's one of the ones that obviously struck him. Interesting that that's the one that they picked. But the other thing I kind of want to talk about real quick, going back to the beginning of Side 4, is mm-hmm. the, the rumor or the legend is that even though if you listen to these songs, except for Rocket Ride, you think Ace Freely is mm-hmm. playing on it? I think it was actually Bob Kulik. It was. Impersonating. Because, you know, like, man, he's playing pretty well on this. I don't think it was Ace. I think it was Bob. And if they had to touch up any of the live stuff, my guess is that was Bob as well, because Ace wasn't around much. And if they were, yeah. if they touched up Alive, why in the world wouldn't they touch up Alive too? That wouldn't make sense, right? Correct. And this Correct. is a formula, and Alive 1 worked extremely well. So why would you not follow the formula for Alive 2? If Bob's coming in to touch it up, have him do it again. Now, allegedly, Paul played all the guitars on any way you want it and and ace ace of course played on rocket ride but yeah bob played on the other three and probably some more that we maybe not don't have all the details yeah that was kind of before things were spread out all over the universe but yeah now it's not a it's not a secret that yes ace was just kind of fed up with the whole thing at this point in time I think back at the beginning, they were, Paul and Gene were mad that Ace and Peter got equal shares of everything. Mm-hmm. It was, it, everything was split equally four ways. They feel, they felt like they weren't pulling their weight. And I probably Ace and, uh, Ace and Peter were like, yeah, I mean, we're rock stars for a reason. Let's go out and act like that. And, you know, Gene Simmons is all about the business. So definitely the, the, the fracture here is shown pretty hard. But they, they also kind of had to take a step back because like, oh, Peter's no good. But then he has Beth and it's the biggest hit you ever have, you know. It's mm-hmm. like, okay, Ace, he can't sing. You know, Shock Me wasn't that big a thing. And they actually said, okay, Ace, good luck with your solo album. You need help, call us. And then whose solo album does the best? It's mm-hmm. Ace's solo album, right? Which then when Dynasty comes out, Ace gets not one, not two, but three songs that he gets to sing lead on, right? And the same with Unmasked in 1980. They gave Ace three songs to sing on. So, because they're like, hey, you know, if it worked, if it was a hit, it can benefit us all, right? Kind of the opposite of the Eagles, like, okay, the best thing for the Eagles is to not have everyone sing, it's just to have Don Henley sing. Because it's like, Correct. well, the best thing for us is we have to give Peter a song, and we should give Ace more songs since he's the one who's coming up with hits. So, yeah, I mean, this was kind of the end of the heyday, 78. They put out the greatest hits album, which is usually the sign of the, the best days are behind you. They put out... All their solo albums, which kind of shows we might just be breaking up if we can all go mm-hmm. do solo albums, even if they all have the Kiss name on them. And then Alive 2, putting out your second live album in two years. Yes, it's all original versus Alive 1, but it's it was the end of an era. And obviously Dynasty with, although I love I Was Made for Loving You now, at the time, <laughs> if you were a hard rock and Kiss fan, you were pissed. <laughs> now, it helped them in Europe. Because they love the disco in Europe, and they helped them in places like Australia. But it's the reason why they couldn't tour America in the early 80s. Because the hardcore fans are like, 
that's not my band anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and, it, and it started to kill him. So this this was the end of the Kiss heyday, 1978 and Alive 2. Although Alive was the one that really broke them, to me, Alive 2 captures the best Kiss ever were at the height of yeah. the power. Yeah. Something else interesting that I've learned while I've been over here, obviously we know what the KISS logo looks like uh, and we know what it looked like on Alive 2 because we listened to it so much back in the day. But in Europe and specifically in Germany and then a lot of other places because you don't necessarily just make something just for Germany. A lot of times you make one thing for America and one thing for the rest of the world or maybe one thing for Europe. But because the S's in KISS look a heck of a lot like the Nazi SS symbols, uh, which, yeah. which, which was created by Ace, by the way, back in the day. Albums in Germany cannot have the classic KISS logo. They have to change the S's slightly. And when I got on Amazon UK, just to kind of see, because I already own it, and I actually own it in two forms because they put out a box set of the Alive box set, one through four, um, about 15 years ago. So I just went ahead and got Alive one, two, three, and four all in one set. So I wasn't going to buy it again. I just kind of wanted to check it out. And when I looked in the Amazon UK, it had that kind of odd looking S, S's on the back. And I'm like, God, I I'm might, looking at it now. I might just buy it just to have it because that's hard to get in America, right? But they almost look like C. Uh, exactly. Yeah, they, they look. Yeah. It looks kind of weird. Um, <laughs> so Kiss's live legacy is set. I mean, seeing them live is amazing. We did see them live without the makeup before they got back together, and then I don't know how many times I saw them live with the makeup again. Probably about five or six. And then I said, okay, that's it. I've seen Kiss. I never need to see them again. They're getting older. I'm getting older. I'm not chasing after Kiss. And then, you know, I have a daughter uh, and I want to indoctrinate her into music. And they have an amazing movie. Scooby-Doo and Kiss in the rock and roll theme park mystery or whatever it was. And it's actually... It's actually really, really good. I mean, it's it's got all sorts of subtle kiss references in it. You know, there's girls named Christine and there's girls named Shandy and Shandy Strutter's her name, you know. And they put a lot of great kiss songs in there. Some of them they re-recorded because Tommy and Eric were in the band then. But it's awesome and it's something we could watch together. So when Kiss did their end of the road tour and they came to Louisville, I took my four-year-old daughter to see Kiss. We both put on the makeup and we went to see Kiss. She didn't make it through the whole thing, but I was proud of her. And then we moved to London and hey, guess who's coming to the O2? It's Kiss! So we had to go see them again. So now I guess I've seen Kiss 10 times. And again, I I don't think it'll happen again. I think I'm finally done. But you never know because (laughs) I've quit before. Uh, (laughs) So you, you never can tell. But I wish my my parents had the forethought to take me to see KISS and ACDC, by the way, in Louisville when I was four in 1977, the way that I took my daughter to see them when she was four. What what can I say? I'm a much better parent. What can I say? I did see them on the end of the road tour uh, again because you know they were promoting as the as the last time out. Mm-hmm. The crowd was uh, this was in Florida. The crowd was a little uh, not to my liking. It was very low energy, mm. but the show was fantastic. They sounded great. Everything blew up. You know, Paul had the thing where he would come out on the high wire or whatever mm-hmm. that was out to the middle and play a couple of songs. I mean, for guys who are pushing seventy, they're they still deliver a high energy show. And they, I mean, it could be the fact that they've got, you know, Tommy and Eric Singer in there now, some younger guys who mm-hmm. can, you know, maybe inject a little bit of youth into the band. But yeah, they still put on a great show. They they understand that you paid to see a show, they are going to give you a show. It's fun. It's fun. If you mm-hmm. never saw Kiss Live and you consider yourself a rock and roll fan, you've got to do whatever it takes to go see him on the end of the road tour now. It may not be exactly the same as back in the day, but it is still a ton of fun. You'll see stuff blow up. You'll see him fly through the air, fire, blood, pyrotechnics, great riffs, great solos, and just people having a lot of fun. (laughs) 
So Kiss Alive 2, a classic by any measure in the history of Kiss, not only because of the live performance on there, but because of the songs that it captured. Those three albums that came out after Alive, Destroyer, Rock and Roll Over, and Love Gun, really cemented the band's future, showed that they could live up to the challenge of having a big hit like Kiss Alive and make new material that was going to continue to attract new fans for decades. Next week, we discuss The Joshua Tree by U2, undeniably an all-time classic classic on both sides of the Atlantic. We'll tell you how the Joshua Tree impacted our lives via MTV and the radio all next week. So until then, rock and roll fans, did we get something right? Did we get something wrong? Did we miss the point? Do you want us to review your favorite band or record? Let us know. Tweet us at ugly underscore werewolf and check out all past episodes at www.uglyamericanwerewolf.libsyn.com. Until then, rock and rollers, be cool and stay safe.